Welcome to the Restless Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. We've got a lot to get through today, Rory. We're going to talk about the coronation of your friend, the King. Uh, we're going to talk about the energy crisis across Europe and particularly something that you've been picking up about worries in Germany. Uh, we're going to give a little plug to our splendid leading interview with Tony Blair. And we're going to talk about the BBC, ex-chairman, and what the future of the BBC might be and what sort of person they should get. And we're also going to talk about something called Oracy, which is, um, well, we'll explain what it is later in the show. And Alistair, I'm seeing you in a bookshop with your books behind you. Just a quick, quick reminder, book now on sale. They're not my books. I'm in a books, I'm in the stock room of a bookstore where once we've recorded the podcast, I'm going to sign... I think it's about 700 books that Rest is Politics listeners have asked for personal dedications. I will have RSI by the end of the day. So I'm in the stock room, and you'll be pleased to know, Rory, given you're the arch monarchist in the team, and the coronation is one of the things that we're going to talk about, you can see that they've put out a load of union flags behind me. That's right, presumably for your benefit. Where is yours? Well, I, I, I'm, I feel ashamed now I see that you are doing a podcast with a union jack behind you, and I will, I will try to sort that out in future. So, Rui, will, will you easily be able to find a union flag in Amman? Will they be on sale? Are people in Jordan getting ready for the coronation? I see it's live on Al Jazeera. I've been thinking about this a lot, actually, because I was imagining that I was going to be assaulted by you, because you are, of course under the surface, basically a Republican, uh, despite some occasional expressions of sympathy for the monarchy. But I've been thinking about it. I, one of the things that I think fascinates the world is ritual. And I think one of the problems that many people, many of my friends have in Britain is with the whole idea of ritual. They don't like the idea of symbolic traditional ceremonies. It makes them uncomfortable. But the rest of the world is suffused with them. I mean, I've sat in Pakistan for weddings which take literally four days where you have a day dedicated to turmeric on the face a day dedicated to henna or in java where you you know the groom breaks a, an egg with his foot and the bride throws um betel nut so much the rest of the world is much much more comfortable in weddings in funerals in presidential inaugurations with ritual but hold on we we are you talk about ritual i mean we're going to have an absolute surfeit of ritual added to which they've now added to the sense of ritual by announcing that we're all sitting in front of our tellies watching the coronation, supposed to join in this chorus of millions to swear allegiance to the king and his heirs. Now, you, I presume, Rory, being a kind of very, very firmly established member of the establishment and with your own royal connections, I presume you won't be in front of the telly, that you'll be in the nave. Well, I think wherever one is, one's meant to be swearing allegiance. Um, can I? You're avoiding the question. You're avoid Rory, it's going to be televised. It's going to be televised. <laughs> you'll be filmed arriving. Are you going to be in the nave or not? I think we're, at the moment we're holding off answering those kind of questions. I think even David Beckham hasn't said whether he's going to be there. As far as one, I don't really know who's going to be there. Um, but you'll find out. Obviously, listeners will find out. Well, we, we, know, we know that former prime ministers are going to be there. Are you going That's to it. be sitting behind or in front of <laughs> Boris Johnson and Liz Truss? Can I, can I avoid your question and give you, give you just a little bit of context for listeners okay. on this allegiance? So um, what used to happen, and, and one of the strange things, I think, that the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's suggested that people should be invited to do this, has been struggling with, is that the last coronation obviously was 70 years ago in a very, very different world and a very different society. And when you watch that coronation, it's extraordinary because you have all these ancient dukes and peers with their crowns coming on and off their heads. And they were all meant to come up at that coronation, one after another. I think it was clergy, then the royal family, then the dukes, then the marquises, all in order. And they were supposed to say, I become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. And faith and truth I will bear unto you to live and die against all manner of folks. So help me God. Mm. So I guess the problem facing the archbishop was, what's he going to do about that? So presumably you'd agree as a starting point, it wouldn't have been very suitable today to have a procession of dukes, marquises and earls walking up, pledging their troth and nobody else saying anything. It depends, Rory, how much we are attached to old ritual. <laughs> which you just told me a moment ago, we are attached to. Well, obviously, I, I quite like that. I'm, loving, but, I'm but, loving the way. I'm loving the way. I'm sensing here 
that this kite having been flown and it's not flying quite the direction that people want to, it's now all being landed upon the Archbishop of Canterbury <laughs> as opposed to the royal household. But carry on with your excellent explanation so far. Well, so I guess the, the point is that they've changed the ceremony a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think there are a lot of things about it which are which is smart. I think a really, really good improvement. So it's going to begin with processions of faith leaders from all faiths. And instead of what would have happened in the past, which is most of these amazing bits of royal rituals. So there are, there's a glove, there's, a, there's three different swords, there are two different scepters, there are orbs, there are cloaks. These things used to be generally handed over by ancient members of the aristocracy who had inherited these um, responsibilities, some of them in sort of 15 parts over 900 years. But this time around, a lot of them are going to be done by people like your friend, Baroness Helena Kennedy. Mm -hmm. There's going to be uh, members of the House of Lords, but they're mostly life peers. So Said Karmal, who's a conservative Muslim uh, life peer, is doing the armils, which are the bracelets. Gillian Merrin, who's a Labour peer and is from the Board of British Deputies is going to do the robe. Narendra Patel, who's a crossbencher, is doing the ring. Indrajit Singh, who's a 90-year-old crossbencher, is going to do the glove. So anyway, lots of different changes. And I guess somewhere in the middle of trying to change it up is this question of this oath of allegiance, which obviously really sticks in your gullet and you don't like it. <laughs> Listen, I like the fact that the Archbishop's people, when they were briefing it out at the weekend, said there are going to be lots of new elements that reflect the diversity of contemporary society. And you've alluded to some of those. That was that was a very kind of multi-ethnic list of people that you read out there. And that's 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 great. I think that's a good thing. I also like the fact that the languages of Britain, including Welsh with a hymn, Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic are all going to be used. I think that's a good thing. And by the way, Rory, while we're on the subject of Welsh, I don't know if you noticed, you got a lot of criticism from our Welsh listeners last week who felt that you, the word they kept using was snorted. You snorted at me trying to stress <laughs> the importance of Welsh as a, as a language. So do you want to deal with that one? Because you're a big fan yes. of the union. You presume yeah. you support all the languages of the union. I, I do. I do. And I'm actually very interested in Welsh because I was a Cumbrian MP. And Cumbria is, of course, the Old North. And it's where a lot of the most ancient Welsh literature comes from Cumbria. The Gododin happens just across the border. I was snorting, I think, for a couple of things. But one of them is I really hate lists. And I think you produced a figure that it was the 50th most influential language in the world. I have zippo idea how you arrive at the notion that it's the 50th most influential language. I just said it was the world language barometer. I don't know how they arrived at it. Yeah. So you weren't snorting at the language. This is a firm rebuttal. You were not snorting at the language. No. And actually, I want to take this opportunity to share my favorite Welsh word which I was reminded of by a friend of mine called Roger Pauli. And the word is kuhnevin, which is pronounced, which is written C-Y-N-E-F-I-N. And it signifies all the different factors in your environment that influence you in ways that you can't understand. So not just your sort of ecosystem, but temporal, physical, cultural, spiritual. So that's my Welsh word for the day. That's a good word. Well, I think you've, I think that was a good comeback. I think linking Cumbria to Wales, I think having a word up your sleeve, I think that was excellent. Let's get back to the chorus of millions. Now, you will be in the nave. We've established that by your dodging my question. We know that. And you'll be there. And because you're quite an important person, you'll probably be there with your wife as well. So it's like, even if I go to church on the rare occasions that I go to church, I do find myself involuntarily sometimes joining in in the bits where you're meant to join in. So I can understand why you will swear allegiance because the camera might be on you. And if you don't swear allegiance, you'll be in trouble. But are we seriously expecting people in their sitting rooms to swear allegiance to the king and his heirs? And given the theme of the service, as I understand it, is about being called to serve, shouldn't this, this allegiance, the swearing of allegiance, actually to be the, the idea of service to the country or the Commonwealth even, rather than to an individual, the new king. Discuss. Yeah, I think very good challenge. And I think this all goes to the heart of what we think about kings and what we think about our constitution. We are a monarchy and a lot of bits, the army, for example, still do feel that they are pledging to a monarch rather than a country. Mm -hmm. And it's part of not being a republic. Look, I, I suppose the, the best argument that I saw against the um, 
the mass invitation to swear allegiance was made in The Guardian, where there was an article saying the problem with it is that it causes problems for people who are neutral. Mm. That there are many, many people out there who don't want to be put in the position of having to either swear allegiance or make a statement by not doing so. If it's the same piece I read, I think it was less about neutrality, more about indifference, people who don't really care. So they don't want to be forced to, to make a choice. Yeah. And I, I, I can completely see that. I can also see why they wanted to move away from the only oaths being made by the, the, the lords and the dukes. But it's, it's also similar things happen. Remember, one of the things that's, I think, maybe stirring this up is that at the heart of the culture wars in the U.S., is the pledging allegiance to the flag. So, um, you know, very close friends of mine, relatives of mine in the States get very, very angry at being made to pledge allegiance to the flag in the United States. Mm. I mean, let's just let's just say what it is that we're expected to rise. I'm not sure whether we're supposed to stay seated on the sofa in front of the TV or whether we stand and put our hand on our heart or on a Bible. It, it's incidentally not not compulsory. It's it's okay, voluntary. You're okay, right. <laughs> but the words the words that we're invited to say together are: I swear that I will pay true allegiance to Your Majesty. He's there. We're now assuming that he could hear us on our sofas, and to Your heirs and successors according to law. So help me God. So are we legally bound to swear <laughs> allegiance to his majesty and theirs and successors? So this is about George as well. Yeah. I don't know what the constitutional basis this is. I mean, obviously in the Middle Ages, it was very, very fundamental, wasn't it? Exactly, because they were the law. They decided the laws. I, I become your liege man of life and limb of earthly worship and faith and truth. Yeah, but we had we had, we had we had a separation of powers, if you remember, and 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 we then had this Parliament thing came along, and they set the laws. But now we've got the Archbishop telling us what the law is. And as oh, you know, Rory, I'm a fan of the Archbishop. I like the Archbishop a lot. Yeah. Well, that aside, let's get you on to the main thing. What do you think about the main thing? Do you enjoy the sense it's going to be a lot of ritual? Do you think it's a waste of time, waste of money? Are you happy because it only happens once every seventy years? To not care too much about it. What's your basic emotional reaction? Well, I've got to say that given that Prince Charles has had the longest apprenticeship in history, and I don't will, wish him ill at all, but it's not going to be another 70 years before the next one, is it? Because if it is, he becomes the oldest person who ever, who ever lived. Um, first of all, will I watch it? I probably will watch it. Um, will I be interested in it? I will be interested in it. Will I find it both fascinating but also slightly troubling? I think I will. I've always, I could think I've said to you before, my first ever major row with my mother was about my refusal to listen to the <laughs> Queen's Christmas Day message because I just didn't see what she had to do with my life as a six or seven year old, whatever I was. Um, and my mother felt that we should always sit down and, and listen to what her madge had to say on Christmas Day. Um, and I do think there's something, I do think there's something quite strange about our relationship with the royal family. And also, the reason why I think this thing has slightly backfired, it goes back to the point you made about people don't like being told that they have to do something. And that was the, I know that wasn't the intention, but that's how it was kind of projected through our, as ever, difficult, quite difficult media. And it's why I don't enjoy weddings. It's why I don't particularly enjoy Christmas. We're all meant to feel the same. And lots of people don't feel the same. So that's very interesting. I was going to, I was going to ask about that because you're quite right to draw that analogy. I think it, it is something like a wedding. And formally, in fact, um, he's going to have a ring put on his finger. He's, 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 it's a sort of ritual in which the king is, is marrying, uh, marrying the kingdom. Oh, my God. So not only are we swearing allegiance, we're actually getting married to the guy. This is getting more and more baffling. Yeah, and you, you'll see he, he keeps saying things like, I do, I will. He keeps being asked these questions about whether he's going to fulfill his obligations towards the kingdom. Well, of course, he said that before, didn't he? Uh, mm? <laughs> Are we allowed to talk about the parts well, of his life that have not been perfect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, the, I think we definitely can. We definitely can. At, at the same time, I think I'm obviously a huge admirer. I'm not, not just because I am a monarchist, but because I've seen him in Afghanistan, in Cumbria, in meetings on the environment where he is just exceptional. Oh, I'm going to give him the environment. I'm going to give him that. Yeah, I think one of the things that I have always been struck by is, you know, I remember in Afghanistan when individual Afghans working with his charities were bereaved or in security issues, he would write handwritten letters to, to almost all of them. And again, on foreign trips, you know, I've seen him often abroad 
sort of doing 12 events, jet lagged, stopping to listen to everybody. I mean, he's got a, mm. he's got a pretty formidable sense of duty. I, I, I'm an Amara. Talking of your, your, your acquaintance with him, I was flicking through the Financial Times at the weekend and there was a, a huge piece on Prince Charles's fashion choices. And one of the pictures was of him coming out of a red brick building. And who should that be in the background but a young Rory Stewart? So what was going on? Were you helping him pick that coat? <laughs> I think this was a visit to Dartmoor Prison. So uh, when I was prisons minister, he came around Dartmoor Prison. He's, he's very interested in prisons as well. I mean, he is, um, I think you'd like him very much. I mean, he he loves music. He paints very well. It's a real joy in landscape. I think you'd share his tree of the day enthusiasms. Listen, I think there's a lot of good to be said for him. And I do think he was ahead of his time on the, on the environment. I do think he's somebody like his mother who's committed to, to doing good. I hope he keeps up some of the causes that he's believed in, even though it's become more difficult. I just think that this point about us all having to feel the same thing. So like, I watched on Sunday night, I watched the BBC documentary, The Making of a Monarch. And listen, it was really interesting. There was some amazing old footage, which most of us, I think, had probably not seen that much of before. And I thought he came across very, very well. But it was essentially a one hour, if he was a politician, party political broadcast. For example, obviously you can't do an hour documentary without mentioning Princess Diana, but she sort of came and went in a flash and there was no sense of it. He talked about his experience at Gordonston School, which everything I've ever heard and read tells me he absolutely loathed. And yet that too came and went in a flash with him sort of saying, you know, it was very character building and it was very this and that and the other. So look, you and I would agree that politicians and even though a lot of them deserve a lot of opprobrium, they, they have a very difficult media landscape. So do sports people. The royal family are given this kind of at that level, at his level, not like Harry and Meghan, but Charles is given this almost like a free pass. And I just think people resent it. Not when he was Prince of Wales, was he? I mean, of course, the, the awful thing is they, they have this schizophrenic thing, don't they, with the media, where they can be held up on a pedestal and then they can be in the most sort of torrid, phone-hacking, grisly... Oh, for sure. They, they, no, yeah. listen, I'm not saying they've had it easy, but um, but I am saying that I think that... Sometimes they, I think we would benefit. I mean, let's, let's be honest, you, you won't be able to see it because you'll be in the nave with your friends. But with those of us who are watching on television, you know, we all know it's all going to be of one tone. I don't mean monotonous, boring, but it's going to be of one tone. It's all going to be marvellous. People are going to be loving it. Everybody's going to be happy. Everybody's going to look wonderful. There's no sort of reality. There's no sort of reality. Which, as you it. point out, that in your in your wedding and Christmases, you don't feel very comfortable doing even at wedding and Christmas. Lovely piece actually by Tom Holland, who is our Rest Is History co-podcaster, which we like to refer people to. And a couple of random facts about it, which people like me who are massive history geeks love. One of them is that the, the king's champion is turning up. And the king's champion, who's a man called Francis Dymoak. Oh, I thought it, I thought it was Roy Stewart, but anyway. <laughs> no, it's, so that their role, you would have loved this role, actually. I think you should have bid for it. Um, used to be to literally ride in a suit of armor on a horse into Westminster Hall and throw down a gauntlet. Love it. And challenge anyone in the kingdom who wanted to fight. And see, now we're yeah, talking. Now it. we're talking. Sky Sport would love that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Totally. <laughs> um, and they've been doing this. Their direct ancestors all the way back to the champions of the Duke of Normandy nearly a thousand years ago. But their condition for doing it is they have to hold on to this single bit of land that they were given in exchange for doing this back in the early Middle oh, Ages. That's how the land got given out, isn't it, Rory? That's why Scotland is owned by a handful of people who <laughs> just happen to be good friends with the royals at one point. This is sort of, well, it's a, in this case, it's a pretty tiny bit of land the poor guy's still got. I mean, poor guy, I'm sure he's a very, very uh, happy guy, but it's, it's a very, very small thing. I think he's only got the gatehouse left, but he's clinging on and he remains as the king's champion. Um, and my second round of fact before we leave this is that they're going to be carrying something called the Cortana or Sword of Mercy, which is broken off at the top and is first described in time of King John, so King, Magna Carta King John. And he believed it to be the sword of the Arthurian knight Tristran and that the top of it got broken off in the giant Morholt skull. There we are. So there's a bit of, bit of, bit of history.
Rory, I know you're going to be busy on the day, but I think with the sort of knowledge that you have there, you should be doing maybe not the BBC, but ABC in America or something like that. That's the sort of <laughs> stuff they're going to they're going to learn. Now, finally, Rory, finally, just as my my mother will be listening up in heaven, and she she died nine years ago this week. But just so that people don't think I'm an absolute sort of could never say a good word about about these guys. The new book that you keep kindly plugging for me, what's it called again, Rory? It's it's not called What Can I Do, is it? <laughs> it's called But What Can I Do? <laughs> but if you go to page 154, I recall an event that I attended where the main guest of honour was the Duchess of the then Duchess of Cornwall. Ah. Camilla spoke of her visit to Auschwitz in 2020, saying she would never forget a speech given by Marion Tursky, Holocaust survivor, who had talked about the laws discriminating against Jews in Nazi Germany in the 30s and the relevance of this to our own time. He described, says Camilla, how people, victims, perpetrators and witnesses can gradually become desensitized to the exclusion, stigmatization, alienation of those who previously been friends. Marianne warned us this can happen again, but he gave us too the answer to preventing it. You should never ever be a bystander. And then she went on to say, let us not be bystanders to injustice or prejudice. After all, surely our personal values are measured by the things we are prepared to ignore. So Rory, if Suella Braverman is in the nave with you at the great event, if you could kindly take a copy of my book, give it to her and mark up Camilla's speech, that would be very, very kind. Anything to promote your book. <laughs> I, th I love that line, though. Never be a bystander, says Camilla. I like that. I hope that's in the service as well. Never be a bystander. Very good. Well, listen, I, I was in France last week and in Paris, I had a very interesting conversation about European energy and in particular how Europe is going to respond to the energy transition. And somebody said, in fact, actually, it's a friend of mine called Ben Judah, who's a, who's a, a writer and who's got a great book on Europe coming out, said that you can almost see country success in terms of the particular energy source. So coal made Britain, Germany, France in the 19th century. Oil is obviously making the United States and the Gulf in this century. But the real question is going to be the future of the post-carbon future. And that is going to be a fight for minerals because battery technology depends very much on things like cobalt and lithium, mm. a lot of which comes out of Africa and 80% of which is processed in China. And as part of this story, Germany is in a very, very serious problem. And, and before I turn to you, because I know you've just been reading a Der Spiegel article on this, one statistic before I turn to you, in 2019, Germany produced 3.5 million automobile units a year compared to China's 0.5 million, half a million. Three years later, by 2022, Germany was producing two and a half million and China was producing two million. Between 2019 and 2022, the closing gap between China and Germany is unbelievable. And so much of Germany's industry depends on chemical processing, which is to do with energy, or creating parts for combustion engines, which are exported to places like China, which aren't going to be needed if you move to electric cars that have far fewer moving parts. Well, your point on minerals is one of the reasons why China has been so aggressive and active in its what they would define as support for a lot of countries in Africa, whereas you and I have mentioned many, many times in recent months, Britain has withdrawn, not least through our lack of support in international aid and development. The Chinese have very much targeted those mineral resources. The article you mentioned that I've been reading in, in Der Spiegel, the headline is Die größte Gefahr seit Tesla, the biggest danger, the biggest risk to the German car industry since Tesla. And it, it, the piece really is about how Volkswagen, BMW and Mercedes have been really dominant of all the global brands in the Chinese car market. Germany has been right up there. And now we have these firms, which I must admit, until I read this piece, I didn't even know about, BYD, NIO and Geely. And these are Chinese e-cars, e which the Chinese have got into their own markets, but now they're actually going to try and get into the into the European market. So the question that the article is asking is, what can the Germans learn from the Chinese? And the answer, would be, the answer might be from what you're saying, that maybe they're a bit late to learn some of those lessons, because the other energy issue that the Germans are having to deal with is this sort of post-Russian dependence and where they go for their energy of the future. So yeah, it's interesting that you, you were hearing that in 
in France, I noticed you were getting out before the, the, the near riots of yesterday. I was hearing the same thing in Germany. So it's obviously the Chinese improving their hold on markets where we thought not that long ago, these were going to be huge markets for Europe for the rest of our lives, as it were. It's changing very, very quickly. It's terrifying because, of course, energy costs are going to be vital in any kind of industrial production. And the fear is that Germany's in real trouble, that fundamental industries like chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and the motor industry and, and, and the parts for the motor industry are going to be under real strain over the next 10, 15 years. Mm. People, some of the German business people I was meeting in, in Paris at this round table were saying that they, they've gone from sort of slightly looking in despair at Britain to fearing that they're about to become a version of Britain. They, they're very, very worried about their five, 10 year industrial future. Of course, they are burning a lot of coal. There was the banning on nuclear. There's the fact that they're having to import liquefied natural, natural gas, which is five to seven times more expensive than if you've got it in pipes in the ground, which is what you've got in Qatar or the United States. And, it, and, it's, and it's doubled. The price of it has doubled since the invasion of Ukraine. Exactly. And overall, overall energy prices in Europe have gone up by a third, 35%. And you have this, this weird thing, which is very common in the way that we've responded to the climate crisis, which is we feel very good about ourselves not burning carbon. And then we import stuff from China that's made using carbon burned in China. But in this case, uh, Europe feels good about itself not fracking and then imports a lot of liquefied natural gas, which is simply fracked in the United States. Mm. It does. It does seem strange as well that, you, that the German government, with the Greens quite powerful within it, have made this decision to turn their back effectively on nuclear and and go go for more coal. So the, the phrase "the geopolitics of net zero, I think, is a really good one for us to to look at in a future pod because mm. that's the mineral race. That's Indonesia and Chile restricting exports of these key minerals. That's China dominating the trade. That's the US trying to position itself on you know, things like AI and, and synthetic biology, China positioning itself on manufacturing and Europe being a bit lost. I read a very um, interesting thing, because I knew you wanted to talk about this, but by the Energy Saving Trust, and they did a sort of country by country analysis of what different governments are doing to try to get people to reduce their energy. And I don't know if you came across this, this phrase in, in Paris, but they, their plan is to cut energy use by 10% in the next two years. And the strategy is called sobriété énergétique, energetic sobriety. This is all about going sector by sector to try to cut down on fossil fuels and reduce um, consumption. And, and I think they've been studying Tesco. Is it Tesco that have their thing, Every Little Helps? Their, their slogan is chaque geste compte, every gesture counts. So they're basically saying it's about, you know, turning off things that don't need to be on and keeping your lights off and keeping the heating down. Spain has brought in some quite interesting temperature limits. Croatia is really doing the stuff about, it's, it's all about information and, and making sure people are aware that how they're consuming, what they're consuming. And we had this exercise in Britain recently where we all got the same message. Uh, we all got the same noise on our phone and the government were testing some kind of new alert system. And in California now, they send out texts to everyone in California at certain points. And the last one read, extreme heat is currently straining the state's energy grid. Power interruptions may occur unless you take action. Please turn off or reduce non-essential power if your health allows from now till 9 p.m. Goodness. It, it actually stopped them having blackouts. It, it, it saw a massive diminution in energy use within the next 30 minutes following that message. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was good. So those who, who were going for all the sort of um, conspiracy theories that were doing the rounds when we all had to do, do that thing, I think if it's used for that kind of thing, I would approve. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I wonder, that's an interesting thing from a comms point of view, whether, whether the effect fades over time. When you first do it, people respond, but eventually they get... They get lazier. Yeah. What all of these show is that it's about trying to get people to change their own behavior and not, not think that every little thing that you do doesn't over time have, a, have some sort of beneficial effect. The, the Netherlands, they've lifted, like the Germans, they're lifted, lifting restrictions on coal-fired power stations, but they've also got an energy-saving campaign. I was very touched by your Dutch friend saying that my Dutch accent was quite good when I was talking about bagpipes. So, I want to judge on this one. They've got a thing called Zet Ook de Knop Om. 
which means turn the switch. And it's a, it's a specific thing aimed at SMEs on how you can save energy and, and, and boost sustainability to try and build up a macro picture. Beautiful. Well, I think on that amazing bit of Dutch, um, we should go to the break. <laughs> Danke wel. Welcome Teruk, or welcome back to The Rest is Politics, with me, Rory Stewart. Und ich, Alistair Campbell, on the Google Translator. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. I can't, believe, I can't believe you looked up some Dutch on Google Translate in the brain, but anyway, well done. It's, it's <laughs> very good. Um, listen, um, one thing that we should be plugging is I, I really enjoyed the interview with Tony Blair. And people who want to pick it up, it's on our separate channel, which is our separate podcast channel, which is called Leading, L-E-A-D-I-N-G, which you can find your podcast. It was very intense because it was forcing Tony Blair to really focus in on the issue of the Northern Ireland peace process. But I thought he had, it was actually, I thought rather wonderful because he was really getting into what it means to be a politician, how leadership works, how persuasion works in those contexts, how you sometimes have to be constructively ambiguous. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, well, I said constructively amb ambiguous. He said tactically cute. <laughs> um, so don't search the rest is politics, people. Search Tony Blair leading right now and it will pop up. Very good. So let's talk BBC chairman. Um, he's finally gone, Mr. Richard Sharp. You're too modest, Alistair, to mention, but it was one of the things that you predicted in the middle of the Gary Lineker situation that Richard Sharp was going to have to go. But what's brought him down in the end is this extraordinary conflict of interest. And at the heart of it, probably the most shocking thing, which is that our Prime Minister then, Boris Johnson, while Prime Minister, got himself into some extraordinary financial trouble. So much so that he somehow convinced the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, to get involved. And Richard Sharp, who became the chairman of the BBC, was involved in introducing him to somebody who lent him £800,000, and this was not declared. Did the somebody who was also weirdly a distant relative of Johnson, did he lend in the money or guarantor? Was he the guarantor? We still don't know where the money came from. His name was Sam Blythe, but he didn't lend the money, I don't think. So Simon Case said it was okay to take the money because it was coming from a relative. But the point of the whole story is that Boris Johnson can't have known this relative very well if he had to be introduced to this person via Richard Sharp. It appears as though this person's a semi-stranger who needed to be introduced to him by Richard Sharp. Yeah. I mean, I can remember, look, I was only, as it were, a, a, a lowly special advisor to the then prime minister. But I can remember having the security people warning us of the dangers of blackmail and being, you know, having, ending up owing. One of the things they asked you when you, you're vetted is whether you're in debt to anybody, because that, can, that alone can produce a conflict of interest. It's absolutely unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. So uh, Boris Johnson made Richard Sharp the chairman of the BBC after Richard Sharp had offered to help him out of his financial difficulties. I mean, there, there couldn't be a clearer um, conflict of interest. But somewhere in the heart of this also is something that we, we should talk about again, which is Simon Case, the cabinet secretary, who I believe you, you met recently, Alistair, but it's very, very odd. I, I was obviously singing the praises of people like Bertrand and even Richard Wilson, who I think was a thorn in the side of, of you and your friend, Jonathan Powell. But boy, would Richard Wilson not, I think, have gone along with this kind of stuff. And I think one of the problems uh, without sounding ageist is that Simon Case became permanent secretary when he was barely 40 years old. He'd only been in the civil service for 12 years, whereas traditionally cabinet secretaries were people who had been in the civil service for over 30 years, had run big government departments and would have had the full confidence. And he was brought in at a time when Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings were firing a lot of the other senior permanent secretaries across the system, Foreign Office, Ministry of Justice, etc., and I, I'm afraid that's at the heart of this problem, that we haven't had a cabinet secretary standing up to prime ministers in the way that they ought to. No, and also there's this, these stories doing the rounds at the moment that Simon Case is at the heart of trying to stop Sue Gray do her, the job that she's been asked to do for um, Keir Starmer as chief of staff. And I, it is interesting how often his name pops up in these situations. No, but, but the real villains, I think you've, put your, you've named them, is, is what was happening under Johnson and Cummings. And this book by Anthony Selden, which at George Osborne's recommendation, I finally got around to taking a look at it. It is 
absolutely incredible. I mean, it's worse than you and I thought. If his account is accurate, it's worse than you and I thought. The levels of incompetence and chaos and the extent to which Cummings actually thought he, not Johnson, was the Prime Minister. Well, also, sorry, just on that, I'm very, very struck when I see you with Tony Blair or Jonathan Powell, how much you likes and respected each other, whereas Dominic Cummings, from the beginning, despised Boris Johnson. He was trying to run the country while making no secret of the fact that he had utter contempt for his own boss. Yeah, which you, you can't function like that. And also that's completely... This completely sort of discombobulates the entire structure on which government is meant to run. And of course, the cabinet secretary is the most senior civil servant, is meant to be the person who's ensuring that there is good order within the government machine, that other departments are brought in at the right time, but also does have the role of speaking truth to power. And I think there comes a point with somebody like Simon Case, where if you are working alongside somebody like Johnson and Cummings, I think there does come a point where you say, look, I cannot on the one hand be expected to operate by standards that are expected of senior civil servants and on the other, go along with some of the nonsense that I'm seeing. And this was nonsense. The idea that this was not, that this loan should not have been disclosed is absolute total nonsense. We've also been talking a little bit about how much our system relies on a strong civil service. And we talked about a little bit with Dominic Raab and bullying in the civil service. But Simon Case's career, which I've been looking at, is also an example of another problem that's happening to our government. So July 2014 to July 2016, he goes through five jobs in four years. He was nine months as executive director of the improvement group in the cabinet office, nine months as a director of GCHQ, 15 months as a private secretary number 10, nine months as the director general for the EU, four months as the director general for Northern Ireland before he was moved to be private secretary to Prince William. Now, how is government supposed to function if people at a director general level, which remind people is right at the very, very top of the civil service, are only in these roles for nine months or four months? Well, especially if ministers are sort of changing every, in the case of the the Trust Johnson era, every three, every three and a half minutes. I think we shouldn't, given that we are goal hunger podcasts, which we, You'll be thrilled as I was to see we're at one stage goal hanger one, two, three in the charts this week. But we shouldn't neglect or forget the, the central role that the gaffer, Gary Lineker, played in these whole proceedings. Still playing it, I see, the Daily Express front page the day after Richard Sharp's resignation. And this is the paper, remember, that campaigns relentlessly against woke and for free speech. Front page headline, BBC must act to silence Lineker. And this was 30p Lee Anderson saying that Lineker saying, making exact, virtually word for word, by the way, what David Dimbleby said, namely that no serving government should choose the BBC chairman of the day, which you and I also agree with. And that somehow was elevated into a front page story. So I think we should actually just for a moment remember Gary's heroic role in uh, bringing order and sense to the top of the BBC for a while. And also to remind people that the reason why the chairman of the BBC and the director general of the BBC shouldn't be appointed by the government is that no government can really be trusted. So the Conservatives brought in Richard Sharp, but you, when you were in power, brought in Greg Dyke as Director General, who had donated money to Labour. You brought in Gavin Davis as the chairman of the BBC, who was a Labour donor and whose wife was the private secretary to Gordon Brown. I don't think we could bring in the Director General, but the, but the government does appoint the chairman. I should point out in my own defence, Rory, that that story ended with, how shall we say, somewhat bad blood between all of us, or particularly, <laughs> particularly between them and me, over the, uh, our, our dif differences of opinion over Mr. Andrew Gilligan, special advisor to Boris Johnson. Look, I, I think it's absurd. I think it's absolutely absurd. And the other thing I'd say is we need a strong BBC that is prepared to speak truth to power. We need it more than ever. You know, you've got these G GBBs people and the Talk TV people, and, the, you know, they're essentially just sort of mini Fox Newses that are being funded by you know, very, very, very wealthy people who don't care whether they lose loads of money. And the BBC, we should support the BBC. And a shout out, by the way, for local BBC radio. 
and television, which is being shredded at the moment. Shredded. I had um, uh, a message from somebody who works for the BBC up in Humberside, who was saying that you know they're they're losing jobs, they're they're losing, they can't cover the area properly, and this does have long term implications for for the future of democracy. Well, it's we- awful for local democracy, isn't it? Because it means that you can't hold, you don't know enough about your local representatives, you can't hold them accountable for what's happening locally. BBC Cumbria has been shredded to pieces. The incredibly important and important for local identity too. Just to give a, a positive shout out to the BBC, you and I are both big supporters of the World Service, which I often listen to in my car. Fiona says, why are you listening to the World Service when we're in Britain? I said, because I'm in Britain, I'm listening to the World Service. Emergency radio service for Sudan is being launched on BBC News Arabic by the World Service. So that's proper public service broadcasting, in my view. Th- that is, but unfortunately, they're about to end their Arabic language production. Exactly. Along exactly. with Chinese and Hindi. Exactly. So BBC, we both support it. It's gone through a very bad pace. Richard Sharp should never have been there. Good that he's gone. And now they need to get somebody in. Who would you have as BBC chairman, Rory? Please don't say me because it's not going to happen. Sorry, it's going to say you or my, me. <laughs> um, one, I think one really good thing would be for it not to be a politician. I mean, obviously, that's slightly against my own interests because I'm an ex-MP. But I think I, I don't see why so many of these jobs are going to people who've been members of parliament. One of the names, I can't remember, the, the name that is said to be Rishi Sunak's favourite is yet, yet another one from the kind of world of finance and hedge fundery. I mean, it's got to be somebody who understands business and broadcasting. And it's got to be somebody who can stand up to pressure. Who was the best one you saw during your time that you remember? Who was a good chairman that you really thought was doing their job well? Uh, I thought Chris Patton was quite good, uh, but he was a politician. How about Michael Grade? Do you think he's good? Mm, uh, my opinions of people tend to be, because I'm very tribal, uh, they tend to be coloured by people's position on Brexit. <laughs> right, it's why okay. I never use Dyson hand dryers and I will never go into Weatherspoons. <laughs> I mean, there are many reasons I won't go to Weatherspoons, partly the fact that I haven't had a pint of beer since 1986. But um, yeah, so no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not buying the, the love for Michael Grade. Very good. Okay. Well, now the next thing you wanted to talk about was something called oracy, where initially I thought, this is some misspelling. Do you mind telling us what on earth oracy is? It's like Morrissey, right? It's a pop group. Do you not know what oracy is? No, no. This is terrible. Well, oracy, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because I spoke at a conference uh, last week, organized by a a group, a charity, an education charity called Voice 21. And Voice 21 was founded by my former number 10 and Labour colleague, Peter Hyman, who left politics to go and become a head teacher and was a very good head teacher, but has now gone back into politics and he's now working for Keir Starmer. But Voice 21 is about trying to put oracy, which is about, if you like, how we teach listening and speaking on the same par as literacy and numeracy. And there's a guy who was a, did the main presentation, a guy called Professor Neil Mercer, who just gave a brilliant explanation as to why, in the modern age in particular, we have to be able to teach our children to communicate clearly and properly. And it's interesting, he's actually a Cumbrian, Rory, and he talked about how there's no such thing, there should, we shouldn't get obsessed with sort of standardized English, because when he's in Cumbria, he admits he speaks differently to when he's in Cambridge. He's, he speaks differently when he's doing a presentation to a, a room full of teachers, as we were doing that day, to when he might be doing the same presentation to children or to people in a different part of the country. And what these guys do, they, the, the charity, what they do is they teach teachers how to educate children in the art of speaking and listening. And it's also about how you make decisions. So you'll be pleased to know that the, the room was full of people who listened to our podcast and love this idea of disagreeing agreeably. Somewhere in the heart of this, I, I, a little plug for my three-part BBC uh, Radio 4 series, which was on public speaking and rhetoric and its use. And I was very struck, particularly with an interview with two young men from St. Francis Xavier School in Liverpool, so State School in Liverpool, who felt that their lives had been turned around by entering a debating competition, public speaking. Mm. And what they felt about it was it wasn't just about the confidence It was also about empathy, that learning to do these debates forces you to understand the other person's position. 
and forces you to enter their mindset in order to try to persuade them. Well, at the start of his presentation, and, and, and I, I write a whole chapter in my new book about the importance of this public speaking. And it's not public speaking as in standing up and making speeches. It's public speaking as in when, you, when you're dealing with bureaucracy, when you're trying to get something done over the phone. How do you deal with people when you open a bank account? It's, anyway, Neil Mercer, when he started, he said, hands up. This is a room full of several hundred teachers. He said, hands up if you were taught how to speak at school. And about, I don't know, 15 to 20 hands went up. He said, put your hands down if you went to a, if you went to a private school. And I think they were left with two hands in the air. So the private schools do teach. When you were eaten, you were taught how to debate, how to speak. I remember Charles Kennedy used to say that one of the things that made him a politician, he went to a state school in, in La Caba in the Highlands, but they had school debating and he was a very good debater and that's what made him want to go to university and he was a great debater there and that's how he became a politician and i think we we just need this more than ever and i hope that with peter hyman now inside keir starmer's office i think oracy the idea that we teach in the modern age children how to communicate and by the way it doesn't mean they all have to sound like you know queen's english as it used to be called accents are incredibly important People being, you know, proud of where they come from is not inconsistent. And even the thing about, you know, Ofsted, for example, there was a lot of kind of criticism of Ofsted at this conference because people were saying that Ofsted go into schools where, you know, children, because of where they're brought up and the accents of their parents and the way their parents might be, you know, we done rather than we did and all that sort of stuff, that that kind of stuff gets loaded on the school and the school gets marked down. And and so anyway, I just think it's a really interesting area. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the things that I love about it is that in the heart of the idea of debate or argument is the idea of persuasion, the idea that you can actually change somebody else's mind. And um, what I hope when doing is not just agreeing or disagreeing gribbly, but also the possibility of persuasion, because that's incredibly important in a very polarized world. And I think mm. it's what Trump stood against. Trump fundamentally says my supporters and I have this fixed worldview and nobody is going to change it. And I'm not going to change anybody else's mind either. And if you don't have my view, you're just wrong. Exactly. And there's this lovely book by a Yale professor called Brian Garston, which is basically in defense of persuasion. He argues that politics goes wrong when you give up on the idea of being able to persuade someone, because then you give up on the idea of compromise, you give up on the idea of shared truth, you give up on the kind of humility which is embedded in politics. Mm. By the way, Oracy um, is now part of the curriculum in Scotland and Wales. Very good. So Michael Gove, when he was pressed on this, apparently used to say, look, we can't just have our kids sitting around chatting. Uh, there's Michael Gove, who spends his entire life sitting around chatting with his Tory friends. And, and chats very well. And <laughs> He's a very good chatter, yeah. Um, but so there we go. There's one for, for Labour, I hope. Oracy. Let's make Oracy a word that, I mean, I'm amazed that even you didn't know what it was, Roy. That really is. Oh, that's, that's shocking, isn't it? Shocking. Well, on that, I think we'll bring, bring it to an end with a, with a, a, a peen of praise to Oracy. Thank you very much. Thank you.